Hello and welcome back to Business Analytics. My name is Hari Rajagopalan and I will continue with this session uh, on analytics for you. So we are coming to the end of our basic regression uh, in predictive analytics, multiple regression. Uh, we'll still be doing more regression later on, uh, but this is the traditional what people, when people talk about regression, we're coming to the end of what we think of as a regression and we are going to talk about some basic rules, some tips. Uh, there are uh, some other and we're going to talk about other kinds of regression, which really cannot be done in Excel, but we just this is more conceptual rather than anything to do with Excel. So first, we're going to look at some tips to avoid common problems. First thing, before you do any kind of statistical analysis, do a lot of research before starting. Review if this is an area which has been studied before, review the literature to develop an understanding of what are the relevant variables, what their relationships are, whether they have a positive or negative effect on the dependent variable, and what we call as the effect magnitude. So the effect magnitude is how big is is the effect is it is it going to be a large impact on the dependent variable or a small impact on the dependent variable and this will allow you to collect correct data and avoid data mining now data mining to select regression models creates very serious problem and i'll have a separate slide later which talks which goes deep into the issues of trying to use data mining and then creating a regression model and I'll talk about when you can do it and when you shouldn't do it. The second tip is to use the simplest possible model. Use the simple model when possible. Simplification usually produces more precise models. Now this is a rough rule of thumb. So remember, use it as a guidance, not as a rule. An average three independent variables is usually sufficient for complex problems. Start with a simple model, then make it more complicated only when it's needed. Now, when you make a model complex more by adding another variable, it's only when the prediction interval is more precise. That is, when you do the confidence intervals for the prediction, that it actually becomes narrower. Um, when you have several models with comparable predictive abilities, choose the simple one. Okay, so simplification is important and you should try to do the models with as few independent variables as possible. Uh, also, when you look at the data set, um, you should look at, a, again, a guidance, general rule of thumb, uh, about more than 10 to 20 data sets for every independent variable. So if you have three independent variables, definitely should have more than 40, 50 uh, sample size. Um, just rough rule of thumb again. Third, most important, just because something is statistically significant does not mean that one causes the other, even for regression. All regression does is reveals correlation. To establish causation, you need to perform a design experiment with randomization. If you're using regression to analyze the data that wasn't collected in an experiment, you cannot be certain there is causation. Now, correlation is, is fine because if you want to predict the outcome, you don't always need the variables that have causal relationships. You can use other variables as proxies, right? So just for prediction, it's fine. But if your goal is actually to change some values of the input variables to affect the outcome, you must identify the variables that truly define causal relationships. Tip number four how you're presenting your data matters. Use graphs, confidence, and prediction intervals for the results. There are enough studies that show that when you only show statistical significance, uh, people kind of have the wrong interpretation about 60% of the time. When you're showing graphs and confidence intervals, the percentage rises to 95%. So, there's a dramatic increase in correct interpretation when you include graphs in regression analysis reports. And finally, always, always check your residual plots. Quick and easy way to check for problems. Now, 
if you when you fail the model curvature residual plots are always display patterns if you can't see a pattern then you're okay so what's the difference between an expert analyst and a beginner analyst an expert does these things which we talked about conducts research to understand the study area uses large quantities of and here's the here's the key part reliable data and few independent variables well well established relationships uses sound reasoning to determine which variables to include in the regression model combines different lines of research as needed and presents the results using charts prediction intervals confidence intervals in a lucid manner so a beginner does not do research to understand the research area uses regression outside the designed experiments to hunt for causal relationships uses data mining to rummage for relationships because database provides a lot of convenient data he includes variables in the model based mainly on statistical significance uses complicated models to increase r squared reports the only the basic statistics coefficients p values and r squared values and this essentially causes a lot of problems and and the the problem with most people graduating fresh out of an analytics program is they are right here and they get caught up with all the sexy tools that the really the tools which which excite them the huge amount of data they can do and then they don't use expert knowledge and so be careful the tools only kind of give you a direction you need a lot of background knowledge for you to actually be a good data analyst. Let's talk about data mining. And remember we said, the first thing I said is, don't do data mining. So what is data mining? It's a process of exploring a data set and allowing the patterns and the sample to suggest the correct model rather than guided by any theory. So essentially you don't know anything, right? You don't know anything, you go in with a blank slate of mind and you run a bunch of algorithms and you test it with a number of combinations of independent variables, and then you uncover statistically significant relationships. So you end up with a model which is fully statistical significant variables, high R squared, and great looking residual plots. Sounds good? It's not good. Why? Because data mining can take a set of randomly generated independent variables that is completely random, no connection to the dependent variable, and find patterns there. And so you can use them to explain variations in a randomly generated just by chance. Even the more number of variables you have, the more likely you're going to get significant results just by pure random chance. This problem is hard to detect. There are no visible signs, even though all the results are spurious, everything looks fine. So unless somebody knows what you did, which is go and explore the data set, they think this is great right and you're going to cause a whole bunch of problems so how does this happen well when you do a hypothesis test there is a type one error which is the chance of rejecting the null hypothesis that is actually true so let's say we have a, a type one error or alpha five percent this is five percent false positives so every time you're doing a hypothesis test you have a five percent false positives the more hypothesis tests you perform, the greater your probability of encountering false positives. So when you use an automated process like stepwise uh, regression or best subset regression and data mine your data, you're performing hundreds if not thousands of hypothesis tests. So remember, if each hypothesis test is 5% and you're performing 5,000, you know, 5% of the time, each one, you add them up, you're definitely going to get some patterns. So the solution then is to use data mining only when you have little or no theory. This will be a purely an exploratory study. And then you've got to do multiple new studies, not of the same data set, but fresh data set to confirm the theory. So now that we have finished with tips for doing what we talked about regression, we're going to talk about some of the different regression methods which we haven't really talked about so the first one is we're going to talk about stepwise regression which is what we've been doing which is either forward addition or backward el elimination we talked about it but there's also something called best subsets regression 
this cannot this is harder to do in in uh, Excel needs more sophisticated software and what it does is it looks at all possible models based on independent variables that are specified so for example if you have 10 independent variables that gives us 1024 models look at all the combinations right so 20 independent variables gave us more than a million models so it's 2 to the power of p where p is the number of predictors so this can get large very very quickly so which is better step size regression or best subsets now for Excel, your class, you're going to use stepwise because we don't have algorithms which can do this for us. But which is better? So stepwise is better if, if your focus is to pick the correct model, right? It gives us the, the correct model because remember best subsets, subsets, the more number of models you have, the larger you, false positives are possible. So stepwise is definitely better. You'll do a less number of uh, uh, regression tests and stepwise is most accurate when most of the variables are authentic there is no multicollinearity large sample sizes with small number of independent variables so you really need a larger huge sample sizes and smaller number of variables now stepwise regression struggles when you have a lot of your small sample size multicollinearity and then you have a large number of variables, especially if you have a large number of authentic variables that variables really cause are significant and impact and stepwise regression struggles there and that their best subset regression would actually be better. So let's talk about some of the other regression models which you can do. Remember, now we are talking about, so we talked about best subset versus stepwise, which is the process of selecting the variables. Now we're going to talk about ordinary least squared method. Now remember, we that's that's what this regression model we, you have learned does, ordinary least squared, and it has some weaknesses. It is weak with when you have multicollinearity, where where you have two independent variables which are related to each other. It's sensitive to outliers and it's prone to overfitting. You have to address some of these issues. You have other regression. Uh, methods of calculation. First one we're talking about is ridge regression. Now you don't have to get into the details of what reg ridge regression is. I just want you to understand that there are other methods than ordinary least squares, OLS. So ridge regression prevents overfitting, reduces large problematic variances that multicollinearity uh, causes by using a small bias. So it trades away a lot of the variance in exchange for a little bias, which provides more useful, useful coefficient estimates when multicollinearity is present. So ridge regression essentially is when you have multicollinearity and it, it, it basically bias, creates a bias, small bias, and then it adjusts for multicollinearity. Lasso regression stands for least absolute shrinkage and selection operation. Uh, it is very much like ridge re regression uh, when multicollinearity, but it also has what we call as variable selection. Uh, so it performs variable selection to increase prediction accuracy and identify a simpler model. So it, it basically doesn't put all the variables in, but actually selects. So basically ridge regression with selection of variables uh, is lasso regression. And then we come to partial least square regression. This is pretty common. Now, when you have very few observations compared to the number of independent variables, or if your independent variables are highly correlated, partial least squared methods, what it does is it decreases the independent variables down to small number of uncorrelated components. So it kind of groups those independent variables together. All right, what do you do when you have categorical dependent variables. Now remember when we talked about independent variables which are uh, continuous or categorical use binary variables and handle it. But what, what if your dependent variable is categorical? And we're going to talk about the different regression methods we can do for that. So when we have categorical dependent variables, for example, if you are a credit card analyst you would want to figure out um, your dependent variable could be whether a transaction is fraudulent or not, 
right? And this is sometimes called classification. We'll do more of it when we do data mining. Uh, but logistic regression is what we are going to use. So what it does is it transforms the dependent variable into categories and uses maximum likelihood estimation rather than least squared estimate to estimate the parameters. Now, we're going to do an example of uh, binary logistic regression for this part. Uh, the next lecture is going to be on binary logistic regression. Uh, and then we will move on to data mining after that. But what is binary logistic regression? That's exactly what I was talking about. When your, when your dependent variable is categorical and it's predominantly only two outcomes, uh, yes or no, and um, like let, whether you're going to vote for a person or not, if you want to figure out what are the variables that predict whether a transaction is legitimate or fraud, you use binary logistic regression. Uh, ordinal logistic regression is when your dependent variable categories, more than two categories, and it has some kind of rank, like hot, medium, or cold. For example, market analysts wants to determine which variables influence the decision to buy large, medium, or small popcorn. You know that large is bigger than medium, which is bigger than small. So this is ordinal. You don't know how much more, right? You don't know whether this is one pound, half a pound, or uh, not popcorn, but you know what I'm talking about, right? So, but, and you don't, these may not be uh, equidistant, but you know large is bigger than medium, which is bigger than small. There is a rank here. So you can use ordinal logistic regression. And then nominal logistic regression is, here is an example, quality analyst studies the variables that affects the odds of a product effects, whether you have scratches, dents, or te tears. Now, each one of them is a category. And so that would come under nominal logistic regression. Now, sometimes you have dependent variables which are count of items, events, results, or activities. So this is, you have a count data frequency count, right? Now, when the count data has high means, it, they tend to be normally distributed. So you can use ordinary least squared method. But when they have small means, they tend to be skewed. And a lot of times they have a Poisson distribution. So remember when we, very first week you did, the very first series of lectures, you did Poisson distribution. And this is called Poisson distribution. So model changes how the independent variables are associated with changes in count. Again, this uses maximum, maximum likelihood estimation. You need not get into the details, but you need to know these terminology. An example is homicides per month. So Poisson models can be suitable for rare rate data, where ratio, where rate is the count of events divided by the measure of that unit's exposure. So it's something happening in some period of time. Uh, homicides per month is an example. It could be number of defects per item, right? That's again a rate information, right? So that's Poisson. Uh, sometimes you can use negative binomial regression, which is another distribution. Now, by Poisson assumes variance equals mean, but when variance is greater than mean, uh, Poisson cannot be used. Uh, model is called over dispersion, which means it's dispersed too much and negative binomial is a better model. Then we have called zero inflated models. In this case, what you're seeing is that there, there isn't much data. This, this happens when you're dealing with um, events which are, um, which basically for large periods of time, nothing happens. Or there are two separate processes work together to produce excessive zeros. So one determines whether there are zero events or more than zero events. And the other is a Poisson process, determines how many events occur. So example, count the number of fish caught by each park visitor as they exit the park. So you can look at some park visitors, don't catch any fish because they did not go fishing. And others go fish, and some of these people caught zero fish. So there are a lot of zeros here. Similarly, when we look at emergency response systems, this is something Dr. Setzler and I, uh, for those of you who don't know Dr. Setzler, he's a colleague. Uh, we worked on emergency response systems, and one of the issues we found out is in a whole year, when we're looking at data of number of calls coming in a two-hour time period, if you break the entire year into two-hour two time blocks where we need to send ambulances, most of the time, 
there is no calls. And so we get a lot of zeros. And so normal for normal predictive models don't work. And we have to use zero inflated models. So with this, we kind of finished traditional regression. What is next? We are going to do logistic regression, especially binary logistic regression uh, in this predictive analytics chapter. Uh, once we have finished that, we will move on to data mining. And data mining, we'll be looking at classification, prediction, and clustering. Now for data mining, we will not be, we'll be using an Excel plugin called Analytics Solver. I'll show you how to install that. And then we'll move into time series forecasting where we look at details of forecasting and we'll finish with predictive analytics here.